welcome to the Underwater Photography Show. I'm Alex Mustard and sitting next to me, but not speaking at the moment, is Matthew Sullivan. Uh, Matthew's a little bit under the weather today, so I thought I'd take the speaking duties on. Um, and I want Matthew to save his energies up because we've got a great guest coming on the show today. A great friend of both of us, um, Byron Conroy. And we've got Byron on really because he is not only one of those photographers who's very much on the ascendancy at the moment, and his name is cropping up in every major contest set of results that comes out at the moment. And what's really exciting is it's pretty much always with different images as well. Um, but actually, we've got Byron on to talk about where he lives and that's Iceland, because Iceland and certainly the freshwater in Iceland is a real bucket list destination for just about every underwater photographer out there. And Byron is the man on the ground and more often in the water to ask about how to make the most of that destination. Because although it's a spectacular place to shoot, it's actually a really difficult place to shoot. And I know Byron has told me you know, many times about photographers who've turned up there not well prepared and really struggled because you know not just that the you know um, like mike tyson says you know everyone's got a plan until they get smacked in the face well <laughs> at iceland that water smacks you in the face and you need to have a good plan to get through that so um without further introduction um we're going to invite byron on and we're going to get his insights into the amazing photography there and also to look at a handful of his favorite images and talk through those so Saving your voice for later, um, we'll hand over to Byron now. Okay, hello Byron, really nice to see you. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Nice to see both of you, and thank you for the invite onto the show. No, it's great to have you on. Um, you know, we want you on because we know how much of a bucket list photo some of the opportunities in Silfra are particularly, sorry, in Iceland are particularly Silfra. But before that, I actually wanted to ask you about a new venture that you've started this year that I know I've been really enjoying, which is the newsletter that you're doing with Andy um, inside Scuba. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, because not everyone will have, have subscribed and also kind of why you, you came up with the, this idea. Yeah, so both my good friend Andy and I, you know, we were just kicking around, having a little bit of a chat and a discussion one day. And we just thought it would be nice to have something that's kind of non-biased and independent news in the Scuba world. So the two of us, we decided to make a newsletter. Uh, the newsletter is called Inside Scuba, and the website is insidescuba.online. And it's a free subscription model. And then every two weeks, we send out a free newsletter to everyone, and it's got a nice structure to it. And we try and answer questions that people are kind of asking in the dive world and give it kind of our bit of a personal take on it, you know, just based on our many, many years of diving all over the world. And just try and give people like a, a new fresh set of eyes on scuba diving and inform them on some just general topics across diving and also a lot on underwater photography. Both me and Andy are pretty big into underwater photography. So every two weeks I write an article about some kind of topic on underwater photography. And I think we've probably got about 14 or 15 of those articles now. And like I said, they're all available on insidescuba.online. It's completely free. You can subscribe to the newsletter and you get a lovely email off us every two weeks. Uh, but I think the main principle is to try and be non-biased, to try and be a little bit independent as well. So that, that was a lot of thinking behind it. No, that's fantastic. No, no I mean, I, I enjoy getting it. I enjoy I like that you send it out. I always get the newsletter on Sundays. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, it was like pops up on the phone and I'm like, oh yeah, it's a good time to have a, like a, a scan through this. So yeah, really cool. No, anyway, we're here um, to hear particularly about Iceland. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, Photographically, there's not really too much of an answer to this, but how come Iceland? Because I can tell from your eyes accent, you're not originally Icelandic. No. So I'm from Wales in the UK, and around about 10 or 11 years ago, I decided to leave Wales because I didn't particularly like the weather. Uh, and then I found myself living in Iceland, you know, so I kind of moved all over the world with diving. And I was living in New Zealand, and I decided I wanted to be a tech diver. But to be part of a tech diver, you need to be a pretty good dry suit diver. So I saw an advert for a job on Facebook uh, by a mutual friend of ours, a guy called Finney. He was advertising for guides in this world famous Silfra that was actually made famous by Alex's photos and the Sunto adverts and stuff like that. So I applied for a job in Iceland. I came with the impression I would stay here for one year, but Iceland kind of stole my heart, you know? So this is my 10th year in Iceland. Uh, I'm a permanent resident in Iceland. You know, I have a house here, you know, a good job and been here for 10 years. So I think it's a pretty special place to be. The reason I stay diving here though, is I think the diving in Iceland is a little bit different to anywhere else in the world, you know. 
And I always try to explain to people, if you think about this thing called dive show phenomena, I like to call it, if you walk around any dive show, it doesn't matter if it's in America or UK, all the photos are pretty much the same. You know, you're going to see blue water, you're going to see a manta ray, you'll see a whale shark, a dolphin, all these kind of stuff, you know. Photographically in Iceland, there are way more challenges and way more interesting photos to take. And you've got a much better chance of getting a really unique portfolio by diving regularly in Iceland. So like I say, it's been 10 years. Uh, and even now this week, I went diving in Silver twice last week, even though I don't really need to. So it just shows how captivating the diving is here. Yeah. Well, I think also you've pushed back so many boundaries there. You know, the, you know, it, it was basically complete virgin territory. And, you know, you, you, you know, and I think coincided as well with the, the rising camera technology in that yeah. had Iceland sort of gone on the map in the film era, no one would have been able to get a shot of it because, you know, it was, it was all too dark. But actually the technology, the cameras and the lenses has really opened up some of the possibilities there and allowed you to create some really interesting images. So. I was really keen to see some of your pictures as well. So maybe you could you could share a few. We could talk through those and then we'll make sure we quiz you on a few bit tips that people who are looking to go there can 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 do. Yep, no problem. So I'll just share a screen now. Yeah. Okay. So everyone can see this photo? Yes. All right. So I chose this photo as my opening photo because Iceland is famous for the world famous silver fisher, where the visibility can extend to 100 meters. And it's like that every day. And when I show people this photo, they just presume it's Silfra. Uh, but this is actually not Silfra. So this is a place called Odin's Tier, which is situated right in the very center of Iceland. And it's pretty much got the same principles you know, as Silfra. So anywhere in Iceland where the water comes from underground, it's volcanically filtered. And then it comes up from the underground. It gives us this amazing, super clear water. So you can see where the diver is here. You know, the diver was probably 60 or 70 meters from my camera, and you can see them crisp as the day, you know. The water is always fresh water as well, so it's really nice. You can have a drink of the water. It's also fridge temperature. It's usually around one to two degrees Celsius, and that's pretty much the standard that we get in Iceland. And this photo was actually taken on a photo shoot for Fourth Element. So I wanted to take them somewhere that was unique and test out their new dry suits and their, their new uh, wetsuits they were making for cold water. And that's where we took them off to this destination here. But I just think it's amazing that you can use kind of landscape photography techniques underwater in Iceland. You know, there's pretty much nowhere in the world. The only place close to it really is the cenotes in Mexico where you get this kind of visibility. And you could do things like, you know, using ambient light to much more extent. You can do panorama photos, you know, and usually doing ultra wide views underwater in Iceland with the visibility. Yeah, so I think it's quite an interesting place to go to. And I just think it's nice that there are plenty more places like this other than Silver as well. And I mean, I've never seen a photo of this location apart from the one taken by you. I mean, you know, are there, have other people ever been and shot here? I mean, I've certainly yeah, only ever seen your photos of it. There's a few people who've been here, but I would estimate that less than 20 people in the world have ever dived this dive site, you know. Yeah. It is a, a seven hour journey from Reykjavik and you need to cross somewhere around 12 to 13 rivers just to get to the destination. Once you arrive there, you kind of pull off on the side of a dirt track road and then you have to do a two kilometer hike in full dry suit kit and all your weight just to get to the dive site. And there's no fancy entry or exit or any of that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And I personally always dive a twin set. So I'm lugging over a twin 12s with the camera and, you know, stainless steel back plates and all that kind of stuff. Lug it all over there and, and then get in the water and do a dive, you know. So wow. yeah. Yeah. yeah, expedition diving at this finest. Yeah, well, you've certainly uh, earned such a beautiful shot. Um, uh, the the Byron next one. Us, oh, sorry. Byron sorry. took us past where this dive site was when we were in Iceland recently and randomly he's just like, oh, yeah, Odin's tears over there. And we're in the middle of nowhere. Like, what are you talking about? And he zooms in on it on a map and there's this little blip of bright blue water in the middle of the highlands. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like a cool dive site, but yeah, it's he's not kidding when it's in the middle of the country in the middle of nowhere. Amazing. So, you know, part of the appeal of diving in Iceland is the expedition element to it and the exploration, you know, like to be in places like this where you know just a handful of people have ever been. It's quite a nice feeling. It, it, incredible, really incredible. Yeah. <coughs> okay, next one. So, this photo here, guys. Uh, I put this photo in here because I think it's super cool to show people just how colorful the ocean can be in Iceland. You know, when you think the North Atlantic, you don't think vibrant and colorful. Uh, and this is actually also taken in a very special place. So this is taken in a place called Streeten, and that's the Icelandic word for chimney up in the north of Iceland, in the very far north fjord. And this is a hydrothermal vent. 
Okay, so it's thought to be the only hydrothermal vent that's within recreational dive limits. So if you imagine on the seabed, hot, fresh water is being pumped into the cold ocean. And then over 10,000 years, that's kind of built up this cone over many, many years. And when you dive on the cone, there's still hot, fresh water being pumped out into the cold ocean around you. And it creates these incredible, you know, statues and monuments, if you like, that also get all these yeah, beautiful anemones and all that kind of sea life attracted to the area. Yeah, because the water yeah. get under pressure and heat, it obviously gets super saturated with all the minerals. And then when it comes out and hits the cold seawater, the minerals precipitate out. And that's what builds these these amazing chimneys. And they yeah. grow at really quite a rate, don't they? It's kind of they, you know, they can it's kind of, you know, meters cubed of material in a relatively short period of time. I forget the numbers, but um, they're really, really, you know, amazing phenomenon. Yeah. It is very interesting as well because they're doing a lot of studies there at the moment because the local city of Akure have actually started tapping into the water resources. So there's probably four or five of these over the fjord. And now they put these different taps on them so they can monitor the water flow that's coming through and seeing if the effect of the city is actually reducing the water output into the fjord. And it has seen a visible effect since they started tapping into the water. So yeah, very, very interesting what's going on there. And there's a local chap called Elenda Bogson, who both of you have met, I believe, over the years. Very interesting man uh, who kind of discovered these back in the day. And he's doing a lot of research and a lot of interesting stuff going on. There. Yeah. But this one in particular is actually called the French Gardens. So it's neither the little or the large Stritten that are quite famous. This is a little bit of an unknown one. Uh, and it's around about the 40 meters of depth, this one, whereas the big Stritten is at 15 or so. Very cool. Yeah. Super cool. Next photo. So this here is ice diving in Iceland, okay? So if you come to Iceland anytime after Christmas, uh, I believe it's the best ice diving location in the world. And the reason for that, have you ever seen an ice diving photo like this, where the water is as clear as it is here? You know, When you see all these different lakes that people are doing in Russia and all that kind of stuff and uh, various places, the visibility is always quite poor. But here, to be able to see the clouds through the ice and have 100 meter visibility underneath the ice, I think it's quite amazing, you know? This is a little place called Davidskjel. Uh, so David's Crack is kind of the English version of the name. We have a lot of cracks in Iceland, very famous for our cracks, but this one is David's Crack. Uh, and here you can see the divers just running a line. Uh, it's very easy to get complacent about the safety with the ice diving in Iceland, you know? So usually when you're diving, you know, you run a line or have a surface line and that kind of stuff. But when you've got a hundred meter visibility, it's pretty tempting, you know, to, to not quite have as regimented safety considerations, you know? Uh, but for me, this is probably the best ice type you can do anywhere in the world. And I guess temperature wise, it's actually similar to normal, for, you know. Um... Yeah, this is just a regular day for us, you know, good old fashioned one to two degrees. Uh, yeah. But when you do some of these dives in February, the surface temperature can be, you know, between minus 15 to minus 20 if you catch it on a, on a tough day. Generally, the days where you get the bright light like this, where we get the clear skies, is actually the days when it's as coldest as well. So when we get cloud coverage, you know, and a bit of snow, things are generally a little bit warmer. But a day like this, it could be minus fifteen up there. Yeah. So very, very interesting diving conditions when you're doing this. Yeah. yeah. When you yeah, look forward to the snow day for being the warm day, you know it's <laughs> cold. <laughs> but also this dive site, just to get there, you're gonna have to do a hike through all the bushes and all the snow. And I, I have hiked it where the snow is up to my waist. When you're hiking through, just to get to the dive site, it maybe take you forty minutes just to get there. Then you have to prepare all the gear, get under the ice, do all the dive with the camera, all that kind of stuff, get back out. And you, you know, you've got another 40 minute hike just to get back out of it again. So definitely what expert. Country is this? this is very close to Sofra. So it's in the same lake oh. as Sofra. And it's mm. actually just another fissure, very similar to Sofra, but nobody ever dives there. And it's not as long as Sofra, uh, but a super cool place for ice diving. I think it's just magic. Also, because the way the water comes from under the ground, it's actually coming up and creating a little bit of a current. So right where it comes up on the shoreline, there's actually no ice just where the entry point is. So you kind of get a natural entry point. And then when you get 10 to 15 meters into the lake, that's where the ice begins. So yeah, it's pretty useful for us. Mm, very cool. Okay, on to the next one, I think, guys. Yeah, it doesn't look like wide angle. No, but I put this in here because again, you know, people always want to go to land day. Uh, nobody more so than myself, you know, to go and capture all the beautiful macro creatures and all the wonderful colors you see. But most people would not believe that you get new debranks to this standard in Icelandic waters. You know, uh, this was taken in Eyjafjörður, up in the north of Iceland again, uh, just outside the front of Stritten Dive Centre, 
And I took it underneath the dock there in two meters of water, uh, but the water was one degree Celsius. Uh, but these guys, I think it's a dendronata type of species. Dendronatus, yeah. Yeah, I think me and you had a discussion about it once, Alex. I think you photographed it many years ago in, in Ghana, yeah. the same, same species, you know? They've also re um, they've, they've also decided that there's a number of cryptic species within this group. So mm -hmm. who knows on the species at the moment? I think they're still sorting it all out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were having a discussion. I remember at the time when I when I shot this, and then I had a look on your website, and we were just discussing the different changes in the in the Latin names. You know? Yeah, oh, okay. I should think it's awesome that you can find stuff like this in the North Atlantic in one degree water in super shallow stuff. Uh, and there are hundreds of these to be found as well. You know, I think the shore diving in Iceland, you know, you can just do it right off the beach, even here in Reykjavik can be absolutely outstanding you know you've been diving in Garda yourself Alex you know just mm. walk pretty much rolling in off the dock it's amazing the kind of marine life that we get in Iceland and that's a testament to kind of the low population of Iceland and the pristine conditions you know there's very little you know surface runoff from our rivers and all this kind of stuff so the actual shorelines of Iceland are still in a really good and healthy state mm. and you can see that in the salmon fishing world you know Iceland is probably the only capital city in the world that has a salmon river running right through the capital city, and they still get salmon leaping in it right today, you know. So I think uh, it's a little bit of a testament to the pristine conditions of Iceland as well, I think. I think also because you've got the, the fjordic landscape in, in, in lots of places, that also gives you the shelter from the, you know, from the ocean. So even though you're in the middle of an ocean, you've also got sh lots of sheltered water, which makes it therefore, you know, much easier to, you know, to, to get in and, and have those those nice, easy dive conditions as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this where it's taken, it's pretty much in a natural cove. So it's uh, just on the edge of the fjord on a steep wall there. But yeah, you pretty much get no uh, wave action or anything where this was taken. So they can be here, you know, to, to great numbers in the summer months as well. Mm. So yeah, and I really like this. I just like the fact that when I show people this photo, there's absolutely no way they would ever think it was taken in Iceland, you know? Yeah, no. It's the red also looks so great after all the blues of the freshwater. Yeah. The, the only nudibranch I saw while in Iceland was this one. I wasn't looking yeah. for them. There's a big guy just chilling on a piece of kelp. And you saw this funny. in the same place that I shot the photo, didn't you, Matt? You know, it was the same place where you went. That, that yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, there's a place in Reykjavik where you can just walk in off the beach, and you will see 10 to 15 of these every time you go in. And, and I love that, you know, living in the most northerly capital city in the world, you can just go for a, a dive on the high tide and see stuff like this just straight in off the beach. Mm. Very cool. All right, next one, guys, I think. Yeah. So this photo here, I put it in here because uh, if you're going to come to Iceland, there is absolutely no way you should ever come on a dive trip and not dive in Sulfur. Uh, but I'm sure everybody who watches this has seen umpteen photos of Sulfur. You know, it's been made famous over the years by many, many people. And it's famous for its visibility and diving in between the tectonic plates. But over the years I've lived here, I've tried to shoot Sulfur in a different way. So I've tried to do it with different off-camera lighting, tried to use free diving models, tried to use different techniques and panoramas and so on and so forth. But this is one of my personal favorite photos I've ever taken in Sofra. And the reason is it was taken at night, okay? So if you think with the challenges of Sofra already, you know, we've got this one degree water, uh, we've got a lot of problems uh, associated with diving in Sofra with the conditions and the, you know, everything that's associated with the cold water diving. Me and my good friend, Nana, uh, we went for a dive here uh, in the middle of the night, and there's a lot of off-camera lighting used in this photo. So there's a uh, lighting behind the diver, which is causing this backlight effect, you know, and then they've got lighting in the front and so on and so forth. And I really like the way that this came out. The settings used for this photo, though, are pretty extreme, and not something you would typically want to use for a fisheye. So it was a fisheye shot, but it was shot at f2.8 with 6400 ISO, and I think one twentieth of a shutter speed in one degree water while neutrally buoyant and so on and so forth in the dark. So I like the fact that it's a little bit different. Uh, you can actually see the foreground is, a, is not as sharp as the background. That's just because we're shooting at 2.8 with the dome at night time and stuff like that. But I actually like the effect it causes as well. And I like the fact that it kind of breaks the rules of fisheye shooting. Uh, you know, you do enough workshop teaching, Alex. I don't think you would ever tell someone to go and set your fisheye to f2.8, 1 20th of a second ISO 6400 and get on with it. Uh, but I like the fact it breaks the rules uh, and it creates a different photo and something that's a little bit more unique. This yeah, is one of my cool. favorite software pictures ever from anybody. Super unique, I think. And I like the, I like the 2.8 because the out of focusness kind of draws your eye to the yeah. diver more. 
Yeah, I think that looks works, yeah. And the dark, dark foreground as well just, you know, creates fantastic atmosphere, mm. which, you know, and, you know, which is, you know, you, I mean, I, I've never had the chance to dive in Sulphur after dark. And I would, oh, you know, this pitch just makes me want to do that again, you know, as soon as I possibly can. <laughs> but you could dive Sulphur in so many different ways. And that's why it's such an interesting dive site, you know. And you think in, in Iceland, if you came here in December, we're only going to get two and a half hours daylight and it's not real daylight. So it's kind of like golden hour. But I really like that time of year because the sun comes in through an angle through Silpra. So you get a dark side and a light side. But then you come here anytime from kind of April till now and it's 24 hour daylight. So, you know, the, the sun is going to be up. But the sun moves a lot throughout the, the day. So you can have a Silpra backlit. You can have it lit from above. You can have it lit from the side. So it's really dependent on what time of day that you dive it as to the photography, you know, photographic conditions you'll get and the opportunities you'll get as well. So I'm pretty privileged to live in Iceland every day. You know, I can just look at what's happening with the weather forecast. And if the sun's coming out, then I'll go for a dive in Silver and see what we can get, you know. And uh, even still today, after 10 years, you know, I'm still finding new angles and new photos in Silver. However, you know, as you've seen from this presentation, it's not the be all and end all of diving in Iceland, uh, but you certainly should come here and not dive in that. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think people also, you know, because it's it's not just a straight you know, canyon or crack, you know, it, it, it zigzags around. So, um, you know, because of that, it's, you know, different parts of it take the light in different ways at different times of day and year. And mm -hmm. and also, you know, on any one dive, you know, there are certain shots that, you know, you can only do at a certain time. And that, that must make it endlessly fascinating as a photographer that, you know, yeah. there's always that new angle to explore if you go there at exactly the right time for a certain shot. Yeah, my personal favorite time of the year is, you know, late April or late April, May, around three or four o'clock in the afternoon, because the, the sun kind of comes in line with the cathedral and gives you that backlit effect, you know. But you you were over last April with us, you know, you know, the weather can be a bit temperamental in Iceland, you know, we did three days in Silver and we got one dive with sunshine out of, out of the six dives we did. So, you know, you kind of have to get a bit lucky with the weather and the sunshine in Silver as well. Yeah, but I think that's part of the chat. I mean, you know, it's I think that's where a lot of photographers you know maybe don't realize when planning a trip to iceland is they're going oh yeah i'll go there i'll do a dive i'll get my shots and mm -hmm. yes you might get lucky and everything comes together on that dive but i think if you want that bucket list shot you need to plan around two to three days diving to get used to the diving the conditions the opportunities get your head around slightly different settings slightly different challenges to normal and yeah. then also the fact that you're waiting for conditions and weather and sun to be optimum for the different shots you want to do. I think it's absolutely paramount with Sofa if you're, if you're coming over just to get a photo that you seek a local expert as well. I think the difference it will make in your photography is, is massive. Just knowing where those angles are taken, you know, what kind of different directions you should be looking, trying to go there when Sofa is a little bit more quiet or when the light is in a better condition. I think it makes all the difference if you're purely on a photography trip. Well, as the, you know, capital T H E, um, local expert, we were definitely going to quiz you on that once we'd we'd been through the pictures, um, yep. about. So, um, if it's, there's there's one more, isn't there? So, should we look at the one last more. one? Then I'm going to put you on the spot. All right, cool. So here we go with the last one. Um, this is my personal favorite photo I've ever taken in Iceland, uh, for a few reasons. Um, the first of all, the journey to get here. So this is actually taken underneath the glacier, and the glacier is called Langjökull, meaning the long glacier. So first we had to load all the equipment into super jeeps, which are big modified trucks with 46 inch tires, take it up to an elevation of about 800 meters, then load everything onto snowmobiles and trailers, and then take it up to an elevation of about 1100 meters. And then we had to set up a rope system and descend down into the glacier. And then we found this ice cave. Okay, So we heard a rumor that there was a flooded ice cave up there. Me and my good friend Cooper was in this photo. And then we went up there and we tried to do the dive. Obviously, when we got into the cave, we didn't know, really know what to expect. We had a kind of rough idea what the layout would be, but it was pitch black in the cave because obviously it's covered by 50 meters of ice and snow above you and, you know, the same below you. So when we got in, we kind of had to light the cave up. So all the light that you see in the photo is artificial light. There's no ambient light into the cave. And I just think it's incredible that when you look at this photo, I think it was a world first, you know, it was featured on National Geographic and a few other things like that. But to dive in a flooded ice cave underneath the glacier at high elevation with a fragile roof and one degree of water and minus 10 air temperatures and stuff like that, it was quite the adventure, uh, you know, and pretty cool. 
And you'll see here on the diver, there's there's actually a line attached to the diver if you look going through a harness, and then there's a line running towards the camera. So I'm at the end of the line, and then the line goes back up to the surface where we had somebody on the surface so they could communicate in any issues and stuff like that. But I just think the clarity and the texture in the ice and the fact that we've got this frozen waterfall inside a flooded ice cave underneath the glacier is just pretty superb. And, and for me, there's an emotional attachment to the image as well with the journey that we took together. Oh, it's just a totally unique image. And, you know, the stories, you know, almost beyond belief. It's, I mean, it must have taken a lot of, of bravery as well to go into a, you know, into such an environment, you know, you know, very, very extreme diving, even before you try and take a camera down there and create a beautiful image. Yeah, so we actually went up there with four people plus one surface support person. So the idea was we we're going to do two dives, two buddy pairs. Uh, I went in first with this guy, my good friend, Cooper, and I went down and had a look around and we were pretty blown away by what we saw. But it actually turned out that I had to do three dives because everyone wanted me to go in there and take a photo of them inside the ice cave. So I ended up doing three dives in the ice cave and everyone asked did one each, uh, but quite an experience as well. I will just show you this photo as well. This is the journey to get to the ice cave, you know? So it's pretty cool that dry suits make the absolute best equipment you can wear on a snowmobile as well. Uh, but you can see there's three, three of the guys up there as well, and you see the trailer on the back. We had all the twin sets on the back of the trailer, but they all got frozen up and we had a lot of ice all over them. You know, all sorts of dramatic stuff was happening. But I, I mean, think also you come out of that water like you know cold after these dives, and you've then got to make the journey back as well. Like it's, it's yeah, real yeah. amazing expedition stuff. You're so excited by the adrenaline of the day, you know. But uh, yeah, it's just pretty special. And uh, you know, th there was two things I always wanted to do in Iceland. First was to dive in an ice cave, which we did here. And then this year I was uh, diving on top of a glacier. You know, so we went and hiked up all the way up to the top of a glacier. And in around about the springtime, the same time as this photo was taken, we get the snow melt and the runoff and the moulins where the water drains out. Mm. They're kind of blocked up from the winter, but all the snow melt is coming. So they kind of get filled up with water. And I was able to dive a Milan, you know, on top of a glacier this spring. And we went down to about 14 meters deep inside the Milan as well. So diving on top of a glacier and under a glacier, they were my two big ones that I wanted to do <laughs> while I've been in Iceland. You know? uh, there's, there's, there's some crazy people in this world. <laughs> uh, this has got some pretty extreme settings on the photo as well this is another one of these kind of you know like super fast apertures you know high isos and really slow shutter speeds and trying to burn that light in from the artificial light it's actually lit with um, kelvin video lights you know so there's kelvin video lights on the camera and then kelvin video lights behind the waterfall pointing back on that back wall there yeah wow amazing yeah oh it's fantastic my photos so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and then uh do that. Right, okay. we're back. Well, I mean, for I mean, I mean, the obvious question to ask straight away is, how does somebody, you know, do that? Because there'll be lots of photographers super inspired by those images, going, "I want a piece of this." And starting with the with the kind of the more traditional silver experience, what would your kind of advice be in terms of what to bring? both photo gear and, and dive gear. I know in Iceland, you guys have got fantastic rental gear for dive gear, you know, so, you know, what is, what's some of your advice on kind of how someone can book, book it and how long to come for, et cetera? Well, first of all, I, I think I'm quite lucky in Iceland because my main job is I'm the chief operating officer of the Arctic Adventures group and Arctic Adventures, we kind of operate every single kind of tourism activity you could imagine in Iceland. But my hobby and my passion, as you see by this talk, is the diving, you know, and it's a small part of our business. But to me, it's personally incredibly important. But I love the resources I have from Arctic Adventures in order to be able to facilitate people on multi-day dive expeditions and photo tours and stuff like that. So that's a real advantage for me. If you're going to come to Iceland, uh, keep it pretty simple with the camera. So really, you know, if you're just going to come here and do Silfra, first of all, you just need a nice fisheye setup. You don't even really need your strobes if you don't want to, because a lot of the work you're going to be doing is with ambient light. And you want to kind of keep things to a minimum. You know, the water is going to be really cold. Your hands are going to be getting cold. Your face is going to be getting cold. Pretty much every part of your body will. So keep things as simple as you can. And Make it's sure you're really physical. Familiar. You've got to carry it too, haven't you? So, yeah. Exactly, you know. Make sure you're really familiar with your camera as well, because obviously you want to be changing settings, but you want to be doing it pretty quickly. Uh, I think in Silver, it's a big advantage having the new mirrorless cameras. Uh, and the reason I bought a mirrorless camera was because uh, Alex uh, lent me his camera once in Silver. Which, 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 yeah, which was not a very, it was during the middle of the dive. 
And I had the mirrorless camera, I had it on settings effect on the viewfinder with no image review and no blackout shooting. And during the middle of the dive, Byron asked to borrow the camera, which I was very happy to lend him my camera because he'd be modeling for me. And I did a bit of posing for him very badly. Um, but he was taking pictures of my camera and obviously nothing was happening in the viewfinder um, because I had the camera set up to you know not review and not, not black out. And yeah, thankfully Byron figured it all out because I hadn't told him ahead of time. So yeah, I got some nice photos of me. Well, I think a mirrorless camera is great for self trip because you know with this ambient with the settings effect, and you can just see how the exposure will be just on the ambient light works yeah. very well. Self trip, yeah. Uh, when it comes to bringing your dive equipment, uh, there really is no reason to lug all of your dive equipment over here to Iceland. You know, we take many many people snorkeling and diving in Iceland, and we have absolutely fantastic dry suits and undergarments and back plates and wings and stuff. And the reality is that most people who come to Iceland, they're probably not doing a whole boatload of cold water diving year in, year out, every single week like we are. So therefore, we have equipment that's just perfectly designed for the job. You know, we have the best dry suits, we have the best back plates and wings, the best regulators you can need for it. So I kind of rely on us to give you all that kind of stuff and then just bring yourself a nice uh, base layer. So we have really good undergarments, but bring yourself a nice base layer because obviously it's rental stuff. And just be prepared as well. Remember, it is dry suit diving. There is always a chance that you're going to get a little bit wet, you know. So just be prepared to have a second change of clothes with you and stuff like that, you know. So, but yeah, we kind of take care of a lot of the hassle, you know, and uh, make it as easy for people to dive and snorkel and so far as they can. I would also say don't underestimate the power of a snorkel tour. You know, if you're like a little bit nervous about coming to Silver and you think dry suit diving might be a little bit too much for you at the start. Silver is a great way to come over, borrow a rental dry suit, try it out for snorkeling, see what you think of the fit and the feel and the experience. You've still got 100 meters of visibility to work with, so you can have a really good time snorkeling and so forth. Hmm. And, and what's the best way? I mean, you know, obviously a lot of underwater photographers know you directly, but say you don't know you and you're, you're keen to go, would you reach out to Arctic Adventures Direct as a, a good place yeah. to start? So I think say, for diving and photography, I think yeah. it's good to reach out. So really a little problem with the internet there. I think it's just... Uh, sorry, out. I was saying, um, yeah, um, if you're a photographer who doesn't know you, and um, but you, you're really keen, is the best point of contact just the, the general email at Arctic Adventures or to, or to try and get hold of you? But you must get a lot of emails, so I'm not encouraging you to. Uh, so I do get a lot of emails, but my absolute passion in life is underwater photography and diving, and especially in Iceland. So if people have got stuff that they want to do photographically wise in Iceland, please contact me directly. Because we're a pretty good com big company, you know, we do a lot of different types of tours. If you go direct to our customer care, maybe they'll get a very specific request, might get a little bit lost. So people can contact me anytime. I have a really email, a easy email address to remember. It's byron at adventures.com. So it doesn't get much easier than that, I don't think. Yeah, and Byron is with a Y. It is, yes. Yeah. yeah and and the, the R comes later than the Y. Yes. <laughs> byron at adventures.com. I think that's pretty easy to use, you know. Yeah. And if anyone wants to know anything about the company and the tours we do, you know, before they contact me so they can do a bit of research, uh, the website is just adventures.com as well. Well, fantastic. Um, I think that the only other thing is, is I've always been curious about is what's the next exciting thing for you in Iceland? Because, you know, down the years, there's been, you know, so many firsts and so many great mm -hmm. explorations. There must be something there waiting to happen. Uh, yeah. So a few years ago, I went and discovered a former whaling station in Iceland. So I found a, I, I did a bit of research and stuff like that. And I discovered that there were some whaling stations that had been abandoned in Iceland. And so I went to where roughly where I thought they were. And I was flying drones over the fjords and stuff like that. And I discovered a few whaling stations and I did a bit of exploratory dives uh, on those. And there's some very interesting things down there. You know, you can imagine like all the whale bones had kind of just been left on the water. Mm -hmm. a lot of the ships had just sunk down over time. And just kind of all literally like it just abandoned and all went to the bottom of the sea. So I think there's a lot of that side of exploration I would like to do. Uh, but I also really like the cold water stuff and the really difficult stuff in the winter. So I think any challenges around ice and ice diving and all that kind of stuff, uh, I'm pretty into. But there's one photo I've been trying to take for eight years. Uh, and that is a over under shot of sulfur lit up by night in artificial light with the northern lights above it. Yeah. So, so the number of times, Alex, I've been to the entry point of Silphra in the middle of the night, you know, with a camera set up on a tripod with the dome half in the water, and, you know, somebody underwater with the artificial lighting. 
and the northern lights have never come to the to the surface when I've been there, you know. But it gets very frustrating because the temperature is minus twenty, and your hands are getting frozen. You put them in the water and taking them out, and then you're trying to communicate with somebody underwater. So it, it's easy to do it as a composite, but I would like to take the shot of a one shot with an over under of northern lights and uh, uh, artificial lit silver underneath. Well, that's definitely that's something we'll we'll look forward to seeing, and we'll also when we see it know how many years it would have yeah. taken. So if you see a photo of that in UPY, hopefully it's mine. Hopefully it's not somebody else. <laughs> Spit out, 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 yeah. God. <laughs> What's the go. delete key we use? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, well, it'll be, yeah, it's very fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on um, and best of luck with those future endeavours. Thank you, guys, and a real pleasure to be on the show. So thank you for the invite. And, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Okay, yeah. and to everyone watching, that's us wrapping up for the Underwater Photography Show this time. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Bye.